the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Irreplaceable Battle Birdie, Tactical Briefing, Danger Zone News, and Metal Beasts, One Plus Generation Fighter. This season's new vehicles parade in War Thunder began with a fourth generation fighter. But the new vehicles of this update aren't limited to top tier only. So today we'd like to go way back, almost to the very beginning of the jet era. The Soviet MiG-17 became one of the most advanced first generation aircraft, and its afterburner equipped modification may well be attributed to the one plus generation. Today's metal beast is a licensed MiG-17 PF better known as the LIM-5P. Its power plant is a turbojet engine with an afterburner. The center of the fuselage and the space under the engine are occupied by self-sealing fuel tanks. Fixed armament includes three 23mm cannons with a total ammo pool of 300 rounds. Next to the air intake is the radar station. Generation 1 Plus is our own idea, and there's a reason we use it for this metal beast. The LIM-5P is truly something in between two eras. It can engage basically any enemy, following a single tactic every time. The fighter is so omnivorous thanks to its amazing thrust-to-weight ratio, and its flight performance, of course. Even the regular MiG-17 was famous for its dynamics and climb rate. The afterburner pushes these capabilities beyond that of the airframe. Here's what a typical battle looks like with it. Choose 20 minutes of fuel. It's good enough, even though you've got an afterburner. Take off and turn a little away from the center of the map, keeping close to the ground until your speedometer shows around 700 to 800 kilometers per hour. Now you can set your nose up 15 to 20 degrees and climb to at least a couple thousand meters, depending on the map and expected combat contact time. The main goal of these maneuvers is to get as much energy as you can before engaging an enemy. Once you do that, it doesn't matter which plane you attack, be it a primitive Korean War-era aircraft or a swift modern fighter with afterburners and air-to-air -air missiles. In any case, you need to start with a frontal attack. A short volley from two and a half kilometers away may well be enough. If it doesn't close the case, don't be shy to engage your enemy in a vertical dogfight. The LIM-5P is a big fan of ascending spirals, and its pilot will certainly be happy to see stalled enemies. Just a single short turn, and they're full of tiny little slugs. Speaking of slugs, swapping the 37mm cannon for another 23mm one only did the lib good. First, it made aiming simpler, since now all the cannons had identical ballistics. Second, the ammo pool was increased, and can now last through five to six enemies if you don't waste too many rounds. Now, fighting enemy ground vehicles is definitely not what this fighter is meant to do. It has no missiles, rockets, or bombs, and its cannons can only penetrate lightly armored vehicles. The LIM-5 would be a nice treat for those looking for a break from top fighters with all their auxiliary systems and cutting-edge missiles. This machine is amazing for some good old jet fighting, where the outcome is decided by fire accuracy and the ability to trail an enemy with minimal speed loss. What do you mean this rotary wing fly is a combat helicopter? No way! When the U.S. Army decided they needed a light recon surveillance helicopter in the 1960s, the Hughes Model 369 only won because the company offered a truly small… no, wait, that's the wrong word for it. They offered a toy-sized machine. Its empty weight barely exceeded half a ton, while its maximum takeoff weight was only a ton and change. It seemed like its application cases would only include taking off, having a look-see around, and heading back, nothing else. And since aviation technology was rapidly developing, it'd work a short while before becoming outdated. No reason to feel sorry for it since it wasn't anything special anyways. No records in speed or height. It did have some great maneuverability and great handling, though. Still, 
real-world experience discovered a whole range of possible uses for this heli. As it turned out, it was a great medevac option. Thanks to its small diameter four-bladed rotor, it could land on a tiny spot in the jungle between tightly placed buildings or even on a rooftop since it was light enough to be supported by most of them. Moreover, half a ton of payload turned out to be more useful than one might think. It's enough to bring a SWAT team to the enemy rear or carry some weaponry, from machine guns and rockets to an advanced modern anti-tank complex, together with all the surveillance and guidance systems it needs. And, you know, hitting this tiny little bird while it's hunting steel-tracked monsters is mighty hard. So this toy chopper turned out to be truly irreplaceable. Take a look at the modern MD-500. It received a five-blade rotor and a new T-shaped tail boom, and it's far from retirement in the 21st century. Looks like size and mass truly matter. Even its closest counterparts, like the French Gazelle or the German B0105, are twice as heavy and can't even get close to what this little Hughes bird does with ease. Many times, the army tried to start a discussion about something newer or faster, but they could never give up this helicopter. Moreover, it was upgraded multiple times, each time parading across the world and collecting new customers. It's easier to list those who didn't need one, or couldn't get one, of course. From the 1960s until today, no one managed to create a competitor or a decent alternative. There were numerous attempts, but everyone eventually arrived at no less than a ton of empty weight. So what's the moral of the story? Many decades ago, young pilots learned to fly the first machines of this family to guide them above Vietnam. How did they imagine the helicopters of the 2020s? What kind of image did they have in their heads? Some of them are still alive and it's not too late to ask. And there's one more thing. There is young trainees too, getting ready to fly the MD-500 Little Birds all around the world. How do they imagine the helicopters of the future? The answers are probably going to be different. Still, we can safely assume that we'll see some familiar aircraft among those machines, destined to stay relevant even many decades later. As is tradition, we tell you about all kinds of changes each update brings. Not just the biggest ones, but also the numerous little things that might happen to stay unnoticed. Well, let's begin. First and foremost, napalm, of course. It's now available to aircraft as special pods of various calibers. Hey, editor, can we have an epic wide shot so that we don't have to list 40-something top-tier aircraft? The incendiary mix in those pods sticks to any kind of surface and burns even in water. It's efficient at taking out open-top vehicles and burning down bushes so fancied by enemy tanks. Napalm is great, but that's far from everything we'd like to talk about today. Do we have any fans of German cannon assault here? The duck with its 75mm cannon got a bump in rate of fire. How many tanks can you get now in one go? Tell us in the comments. The same increase was added to all planes equipped with the 30mm MK-103. It's now much easier to damage enemy tanks' modules, but it also means ammo vanishes quicker, so use it sparingly. Now, we've already told you about custom weapon loadouts, but it's not the only change, especially for the Phantom. There are new guided and conventional bombs, more Mavericks available, new air-to-air -air missiles to choose from, and hardpoints to attach them to. Moreover, the F9F models 5 and 8 can now drop bombs individually, which significantly increased their cast potential. We're continuing our work on the visual part of the game. The Danger Zone update reworks many parts of the environment. Explosions and shot markings, smoke trails for air-to-air -air and air-to-surface missiles, effects for ground vehicles moving across various types of ground, mid-air HE shell explosions, active protection systems ammunition engagement, the barrel exhaust for the Tunguska's autocannon, effects for hits of rounds with calibers between 8 and 18 millimeters, and even leads falling down off autumn trees. Moreover, all tracer ammunition will now shift its color between the start of the burn and the moment it hits its working color. Moreover, the tracer part can now tear away from the bullet if it ricochets or penetrates, just like in real life. We've also improved the visual effects for thermal and night vision devices. 
You can even see tiny particles now, like sparks. Now, owners of the best hardware will be happy to know we've improved the Temporal Anti-Aliasing, or the TAA. It now works even faster, providing better quality. Visual changes can be found at pretty much every step. To make setting up optimal settings easier for PC users, we've added a GPU benchmark that offers a single-time test once you load into the hangar screen. You can try it again anytime if you go into Settings, Graphics, GPU Benchmark. Now, we've talked about the new ground location, but it isn't the only new map. Air battles are already seen over the magnificent southeastern city. Have you seen what those pilots can do in the tight gaps between high-rise buildings and in the long tunnels? We got to admit, we're shocked. Can't wait to see some epic combat situations for our Thunder Show. Not everyone's such a skilled master, right? In addition to creating new locations, we're working on the old ones. We've significantly increased the detail in the Sun City map, especially on the outskirts. The Poland map, favored by so many, received an improvement to its buildings. And finally, a few bits about the UI. The other tab got too cluttered with decals, so we moved some of them to new folders. We've improved sites for bombs and rockets, HUD elements for seeker areas, and lock-on markers of homing devices, as well as flight and engine parameters. Ground hit cams received icons to help you analyze the shot results faster. Naval cams can now show a close-up of the hit, and various icons report damage status. Well, this is it. Test the changes and share your impressions in the comments while we answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called GamerDude. Is the M4A3105 a good Sherman? I'm not able to decide if I should start with it or end a match with it. Hi, GamerDude. Thanks to its thick armor and powerful rounds, this Sherman feels great in the forefront, so we can recommend starting your battles with it. It's still pretty good as a second tank, although you might need to look around for flankers more often since they'll have found some ambush positions by then. David Lawrence asks, Why do the MiG-23 and 27 have their flares on top of the aircraft when every other nation has it by its exhaust? Hi, David. Countermeasures are often installed in leftover places. Suspended armament is on the bottom. The tail is hardly safe because of stabilizers, but the top of the fuselage is basically empty. Moreover, this kind of placement allows the pilot to use flares during takeoff or landing when the aircraft is highly vulnerable to man pads. Another question comes from Zillarex. What is a better boom and zoom fighter? The P-38J-15 or the P-47N-15? Hi, Zillarex. They're two completely different planes in terms of gameplay, and it wouldn't be fair to compare them since both handle their tasks well. If you need a pure fighter, go for the Lightning. It has a great climb rate and good maneuverability. If you have an opportunity to drive some ground vehicles between air battles, choose the Thunderbolt. It's more versatile. El Guillote Guillen Guillotina writes, I don't understand. Where do you get more points then? In arcade or realistic? Hi there. Seems like you mean crew experience points. Their rates are calculated in such a way that crews progress with a similar speed in different modes so you can simply play the mode you like more. And the last comment for today was written by Ratchet and Clank. Next triathlon, classic 7.7 .7 heavy tanks like Mouse, IS-4, Conqueror, M103, and AMX sur -Basse. Hi, Ratchet and Clank. We do have such a triathlon in our plans. See it soon on the shooting range. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to leave a like. Remember that size matters in War Thunder. Share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.